Hello, everyone. Welcome to the ZOA Book Club. I hope that everyone is doing well. Um, today, we have a very special and inspiring book. Um, and the uh, daughter of the author, is uh, Susan Cervais, is here to speak about it. Um, the book, if you can see it, is uh, Escape from Dachau. Um, really a remarkable uh, study of uh, survival and courage. And uh, I'll uh, turn this over to Susan to tell you about her mom's book, just incredible book. Uh, Susan, please go ahead. Thanks. Thank you so much. First, thank you for selecting my mom's memoir for the book club. Um, the book Escape from Dachau has gotten five star ratings on Amazon, and I'm very excited to discuss it with you. I, I want to start by saying that this is somewhat of an unusual book, um, Holocaust uh, memoir story, um, for a couple reasons. We just we thought it was extremely important to add a chapter uh, to discuss and educate people on what incredible contributions the Jewish people made to Franconia and the German society throughout the centuries. And we have gotten a lot of thank yous on the Amazon reviews for having done that to make it very clear the uh, loyalty that the Jews had to German society. The second thing is, if there's such a thing as a happy ending in a Holocaust story, um, my grandfather, my mom, and my grandmother got out of Germany. So it's a story that does have a happy ending. And the third thing that makes it extremely unusual is this escape story would not have happened if my grandfather had not been saved by a Jewish former official in the Third Reich, who happened to be my grandmother's first cousin. And I'll talk about that a little more as I, as I go on. So I want to start by saying that my brother, sister, and I knew nothing about what happened to my family. We knew that my mom was German. We knew that they left Germany, and that was it. Um, they never spoke a word about what happened to them. And starting in around the 1960s, the German government created a program, Return of Our Lost Citizens, to encourage groups of Jews to return to Germany. They would take them wherever they wanted to go, this kind of thing. And every year, my mom um, refused. She said, I never want to step foot on German soil again. But in the year 2000, my brother, sister, and I encouraged her to take the trip for closure. And when she did, shocking to me, uh, I was there, she asked the German government if she could bring my daughter so that three generations could dance on Hitler's grave, even though we know Hitler wasn't buried there. They agreed to allow myself and my daughter to go on this trip. And my mom started as she saw other survivors talking about what happened to them. My mom started talking about what happened to her and we were shocked. I had never heard anything about this. And when we got back to America, my mom sat down and wrote this memoir, all of her memories of what happened, but requested that nothing be done with it until after she passed, which happened in 2022. So basically as the book outlines, the Jews were very much a loyal and committed part of German society. They were not only doctors and lawyers and scientists and architects, but they were, like my grandfather, merchants, and they were great contributors in, in the arts and music and science and technology. And they were volunteers also in many different kinds of social justice organizations. Um, the, my grandmother's family had left earlier. My grandfather refused to leave because number one, he fought for Germany in World War I. And my grandmother and her sisters volunteered for the German Red Cross. So they, my grandfather believed this is not possible. We are loyal Germans. Uh, I was a war hero, and he just refused to believe what he saw outside his windows. 
He had a very successful manufacturing business that used technology developed by Henry Ford in the US. He manufactured everything from housewares to hardware and distributed goods throughout Germany and beyond. Kind of reminds me of Amazon a little bit. He made friends wherever he went and his clients loved him. So when he, they saw the, his attitude about the brown shirts that seemed to be gathering steam was that they're just a bunch of hoodlums and it's meaningless and nothing's going to happen with that. But um, in basically in 1933, when Hitler became chancellor, Jews really started leaving Germany in droves. And again, my grandfather would not leave. Um, fast forward in 1936, my, my mother was thrown out of the public school because no Jews were allowed at that point. And at this point, the brown shirts were roaming the streets, harassing, uh, beating innocent Jews, putting swastikas on businesses and homes. Um, in 1938, early 1938, before Kristallnacht, they took my grandfather's business, their home, their car, um, everything. And at this point, America had closed its doors to more Jewish immigrants. So Jews were desperately trying to go elsewhere, Argentina, Israel, and any country that would let them in. As you all know, um, Kristallnacht, November 9th, 1938, um, the next day, November 10th, they went into my grandfather and grandmother's home and dragged my grandfather out of the home and took him to Dachau. Um, they, they were, as you know, burning down the synagogues, burning down businesses and homes. And it was basically too late to get out of Germany at that point. Um, so this is where the incredible story of their, my grandfather's escape, this is basically where it begins. My grandmother, Betty Falk Mueller, had a first cousin, Emanuel Rosenfeld. He was a brilliant mathematician, he was a numbers guy, and he worked for Schach at the Reich Bank, which was the, he, Schach, who you might be familiar with the name because he was tried at the Nuremberg trials. He was the president of the Reich Bank, which was in Berlin. It was the largest bank in Germany. And my grandmother's first cousin worked for him. Um, he was the numbers guy. He was the economist. Um, and he was probably the brains. So when Hitler took power, um, a year or so later, he brought uh, Schach to be his Minister of Finance and Economics for the Third Reich. And who did Schach bring with him into his office? My grandmother's first cousin, whose name at the time was um, Emanuel Rosenfeld. So things got really bad, as we all know, for the Jews year after year. And after a couple years, Emanuel Rosenfeld got scared and you could not be a Jew and work in the government for sure, but he left. And But he did something that was very smart. He kept hidden. He had identification papers that identified him as a government official in the Third Reich. And he kept those papers. And he started his effort to get out of Germany. And again, at this time, you couldn't really go to America. Um, but he got scared. He changed his name to Max Emanuel. And he went into hiding somewhere outside of Berlin, waiting and hoping that he could get papers to get out. So as a day or two after my grandfather was dragged off to 
Dachau, um, my grandmother and others were connecting with the family. Now remember, it's telegraph, it's, you know, there's no internet. Um, they are connecting with the family. My grandmother's brother was in America and another brother was in Luxembourg. They were all over letting them know that grandpa had been taken. And word got to Max Emanuel, uh, formerly Emanuel Rosenfeld, that my grandfather had been taken to Dachau. So just as this happened, and this is the amazing thing that we all need to think about, he received his papers to leave Germany and go to the United States. Now, how did he get into the United States? because they knew he had written that he worked for the Reich Bank and he knew where German money was, where they were hiding money, what banks across the world they were using, where all the accounts were. So he was very lucky. He got a visa to come to the United States. Just as he was ready to leave, he got word that my grandfather had been dragged to Dachau. And the family was like, you've got to do something. You, you've got to help here. It's hard to imagine what any of us would have done in that situation. But here, Max Emanuel makes the decision to drive in the middle of the night the 400 kilometers from Berlin to Dachau concentration camp to try to get my grandfather out. And it's an amazing story because he had to get through checkpoints every few miles. And he would go to that checkpoint, probably shaking and sweating, and they would say, as it describes in the book, where are you going? What are you doing here? And the interesting thing, and it is, it was suggested that be at night, at one, two, three in the morning, you don't have knowledgeable guards at these guard posts. They're young. They're probably scared themselves that they do anything wrong. They're going to be taken out in the backfield and shot. So he would get to these checkpoints and he would pull out this leather packet that was his identification, identifying him as a Third Reich government official. They did not open the papers. They just let him through. And the thing is, had they opened them, they would have seen that the name in those papers was Emanuel Rosenfeld, clearly a Jewish name which would have been very suspicious and probably would have ended his life. Um, and he got through checkpoint after checkpoint. And he got to the gates of Dachau. And I don't know that I want to give away the most important part of the story, but it is, it really does say how family will come through and even risk their lives for family members. And often, as we know, for strangers that they hid, that they tried to protect. My mom, when my grandfather was dragged off to Dachau, my mom was one of the children hidden by the Catholic Church. And that's how she survived. And in fact, it was the Sisters of St. Joseph and the head of that order was ultimately taken to Auschwitz and killed. No reason was given, but I have a feeling we all know that it was discovered that he was hiding Jewish children. So, so people really did risk their lives in many ways. And um, my mom's first cousin was quite the hero and it really, pays tribute to bravery and sacrifice and the resilience um, of those that were there. Thank you, that that's really, what an incredible story. Um, 
Susan, um, I know before um, we started, you were talking about the importance of people, you know, other people telling their stories. And I'm wondering if you could speak about that. And I just also want to mention, please, if you have any questions or comments, if any, you know, anything that anybody would like to share about this, it doesn't necessarily have to be a question. Um, you know, I think this is also an opportunity to share your family stories. Um, you know, please feel free to raise your hand um, to either come to come into the meeting or to um, or or uh, place your comments in the chat. You know, for us to read um, to everybody. Um, and uh, I, this this is also familiar to me. And my grandfather also fought for Germany during World War One. Um, you know, they got out. Uh, he also, you know, didn't want didn't want to leave. Thought it would blow over. While my grandmother said, "Yes, it will," and they were arguing about that. And um, you know, they got ended up leaving, being able to leave two months before Crystal knocked. And the the uh, kids in the school that the the Jewish the Jewish school the trade school that the Jewish kids went to when my father was thrown out of the public school um, were all uh, taken to Dachau, you know, on Crystal Knock. So this is you know the story totally hits home. This is a very familiar story. And I often run into um, people or people contact me after reading the book that they have similar stories. And I try to encourage everyone to write these stories. It is very important. It's not just Holocaust stories. I've heard from people whose Jewish family had to get out of Iran. Yes. And um, so these are in Russia. These are stories that need to be documented, um, need to be part of history programs. And, you know, the generation that can really write these um, is not going to be here forever. And it's important, especially Holocaust stories where there's there are deniers out there, that these memoirs and true stories be documented and passed along. The one thing I wanted to mention um, the book goes back to the early 1200s, 1100s, talking about the contributions. I mean, early Nobel Prize winners and um, you know scientists, and and you know we know Albert Einstein and Kafka and so many um, very famous contributing uh, Jews that uh, many of them were eliminated, and they say that. 50% of the doctors in Berlin were Jewish and were murdered. So um, we, you know, these stories need to get out there. And anyone that's listening, if you have a family story, uh, it's important that you um, put that out there. And you can certainly contact me about how you go from soup to nuts to get this done. There is a process, there are people that help you, and I'm happy to share that information. Thanks, we really appreciate it. Oh, let me also, let me just make a, let me just make a quick announcement that um, the uh, Israel Day Parade is coming up on Sunday, June 2nd, and we encourage all of you to sign up to March with ZOA. I mean, you get a free t-shirt and water and a fun day and, um, you know, it's great to all march together and show our strength, um, especially especially this year, um, and especially this year. It's 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 good to hear these inspiring stories about you know an escape from you know an escape from hell and you know and the bravery that that took and you know and, the, and that it succeeded. Um, if you don't mind, I wanted to just share one little tidbit tidbit of what happened at. at uh, is that okay, Susan? That I just thought was absolutely, um, which was I, I thought was especially uh, good that when um, the uh, cousin um, who saved your grandfather um, was in Dachau, um, you know, waiting waiting for uh, the, the grandfather to be brought. He was asked, uh, or at some point, dur some point during during the whole scene, uh, he he was asked um, by the guards there. Um, well, why do they want him? You know, what, 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 why, why do they want this guy in the middle of the night? And, um, his answer was just perfect. It was, uh, um, I don't know, I'm just following orders. <laughs> so it was, you right. know, you know, that, that was the perfect answer that, you know, that resonated with, with the, uh, you know, with any, anybody in, in the, uh, German Reich, just follow, just following orders was turned on, 
you know, it was, so, it was used against us so much, but it was turned on them to to help somebody to escape, which I thought was, you know, was, was a great use of that. Um, do we have any um, questions or people with raised hands um, in the chat? I'm just trying to look in the chat now. Um, yes, I think someone is asking what did they do when they came to the U.S. And that's that is an excellent question. My, many survivors came to whatever country, the U.S., Argentina, whatever. They restarted businesses. They um, they were successful. That is unfortunately not the case with my grandfather. My grandfather really never survived what happened to him. My memory of my grandfather is him sitting in the living room just staring out the window. And so I don't think he really ever got over whatever happened. My grandmother um, and my mom, they had a positive attitude. They were so happy and relieved to be in America, but my grandfather uh, never really survived. And he was alive, but he never really was himself again. So my grandmother's brother that was in America early on had opened a liquor store, a very successful liquor store in Albany, New York. And actually that situation played a role in how they got their stuff out of Germany, which is very interesting as well. So he owned a liquor store and my grandfather worked at the counter in the liquor store. He never started another business. He never did anything else. He worked for his brother-in-law. But my grandfather had, an, uh, I mean, my, my uncle Julius, my grandmother's brother had a great relationship with liquor distributors. He brought a lot of liquor into the, the store from overseas. And one of the big uh, favorite uh, liquors was scotch. And the scotch came from Scotland and it came from, there were distributors of Dewar's scotch in England. So when they finally got their visas, um, well, let me back up a minute. When he got my grandfather out of Dachau, they went immediately to Luxembourg where my grandmother's other brother was. And so they knew that they were going to get out. And my uncle Julius contacted his friends and he had a close relationship with the people at Dewar's Scotch who sent him a lot of scotch. He had a, did a lot of business with them and asked a favor if it would be possible. Germans loved their scotch. So there was a lot of distribution going on in Germany. So he asked his friend, the scotch distributor, if when they brought the trucks into Germany and made their delivery, if they could stop at where my grandparents were living at that time, which was an apartment building because they lost their home, if they could pick up the stuff that neighbors had had all boxed up and get it to Luxembourg and, and, to, and then to Belgium, to Antwerp, where they were catching the boat. And they did that. They had um, uh, boxes of scotch in the front of the truck, which they left. And after they did all their deliveries, they went and got my grandparents um, as much as they could load into the truck. And that is actually how my brother, sister, and I, my mom, we actually have some of their things from Germany. So... To answer your question, the short answer to your question is my my uncle had a liquor store and my grandfather worked at the liquor store. And my grandmother uh, was a seamstress and she did a lot of that. They ended up in Albany, New York, where my grandmother's brother lived and had been there for many years since the early 20s. He had been, he had already come to America. 
Well, well, I thought when you were talking about uh, the scotch that you were going to tell us that they got the Nazis drunk and to get get everything out, which actually yes. is um, something that um, my <laughs> my grandfather and grandma did <laughs> in order to load a few a load a few possessions that I actually have in my home now. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, I, that's. Um, Somebody is asking. Okay, we have a, a couple of questions here. Um, I also uh, Cheryl, want to mention... Cheryl, I'll, I'll, I'll read the questions if you don't. Uh, Cheryl Doberman is asking, um, what did, uh, you know, a little bit more about what your, the family did when they came to the U.S. Um, I, I think you sort of answered that, but if you wanted to go on a little further about well, that. I noticed that somebody was asking how long he was in Doc Town. It was over oh, yes. right. here. Definitely. And his experience there which I have a, even a hard time talking about is in the book, but I have a hard time reading about it and I have a very hard time talking about it, but it's in the book, but it is documented the treatment that he received while he was there as with other, um, other uh, prisoners. I also wanna mention in the book, I have possession of their original passports, all their documents of getting out. When they're, when they're, um, when the Germans came into their home and stole all the silver and the art and everything, they left a receipt saying that they paid them a thousand um, marks. That was a lie. The receipts are fake. They never gave them a dime, but they left receipts saying that they paid for the items that they stole. Many people don't know that, but I have, I actually have the original copies. And um, in fact, I got a call from the U.S. Holocaust Museum asking me what we were doing with the items that we have. Uh, because they would like them. And um, Boston is building a new Holocaust museum. And so I'm waiting to see whether they need some of these items because it's brand new and they won't have any of these things. But the other thing, um, so I have their papers to get into the U.S. What, I have but somebody asked what, what ship... Uh... They oh yeah um it's in here I can't remember the name I'm sorry I I'm blanking on the name of the ship but it's in the book mm -hmm. uh, do you have that person must have family that came over on a ship yeah. around the same uh, time probably uh, it's Cheryl, Cheryl Doberman um so maybe they they can uh, you know let yeah. you know there weren't too many ships you know after right. you know, at, at that right. point exactly at that point um, and, um yeah so. Many, many years later, actually in 1948, just as an aside, in 1948, Max Emanuel wrote an article for Reader's Digest called Beware of Shah and documented a lot of very bad things about him. So it was just interesting that uh, later on he felt that he really needed to uh, write that because, as you know, uh, Shah was um, tried at the Nuremberg trials and let go. He did not go to prison. Um, so he chose to write about him. Um, also, um, we have the question from Cheryl Doberman as, as to whether um, your family tried to go to Shanghai, which was you know, one, one of the um, places that, uh, you know, some a few Jews were able to escape to? No, they did not. They tried to get, uh, go to Argentina. And I have a lot of family in Argentina, in Buenos Aires. Mm -hmm. So I know that they tried to go there and, um, and they, they tried to go to the U.S. mostly because they had family there. In, in those places. So I have a lot of family in Israel as well. So some of them got to Israel um, 
and they ended up getting papers to go to the United States uh, before they needed to respond to whether they were going to Argentina or to Israel. So they chose to come to the United States. One of my grandfather's brothers was here and my grandmother's brother was here. Oh, and Robert Olish is asking, do you know whether the author's family is from Sloanim, Poland, now in Belarus? So that is my father's. Oh, that's so interesting that you know that there is a Slonim um, in Belarus. That is another very interesting story because uh, it was Slonim, Russia. And before the time of the czar, that is my father's side of the family, the Slonims. And um, the Apparently, the history is that my great, great, great grandfather was a rabbi in the town and very respected. And the story reads like Fiddler on the Roof. Everybody would go to him for their problems and he would resolve problems. And they actually, this is before the time of the czar, so it's probably great, 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 great. Um, they named the town after him. And that is our Slonim Russia, which you're right, it was part of Georgia and then part of Belarus. So that's very interesting that you know there that that exists. Not many people know that. That oh, might be it? another, that's another book. <laughs> this, is, this is our listener, uh, Robert Olish, who, who knew this, who yeah. was, had this. It's amazing uh, that you knew that. that. Amazing yeah. knowledge. Thank Apparently you, Robert. that's my family. Yes. Um, and we also have a question from Josh Ravitch. Um, I'll read it. I was talking with a, a Russian Jewish immigrant friend who shared her story to me, hiding in the basement to do services, and then was accused of conspiracy. I encouraged her to write her story, and she declined, saying it's just too common and so not interesting. How do I get her to change her mind? Great question. That I think that um, a lot of times people feel as though it really is sort of a burden to write these stories. And what I would suggest, because it's just helpful to, for them to realize it, is that she should at least start by dictating it. What she knows, she should dictate it um, onto, um, well, I'm kind of old fashioned. In the olden days, I'd say tape it on a tape recorder or whatever, but she should dictate it and just get it out on, pa you know, on paper, so to speak, by dictating it. It makes it a lot easier. And then she can go to a publisher like we went to Let's Write Books, Howard Van Ness, who, by the way, his last name is Van Ness, but he's Jewish, uh, helped us from soup to nuts with the editing. They did the, the design, the cover design. They did the blurb on the back. They got the Library of Congress number for us and got it on Amazon. We just sat back and they did all the work. I think if you let people know that this can be done without being burdensome, they're more likely to do it. And the other thing is that no story Every story is different. Um, there are so many Holocaust stories. There are so many escape from Russia stories. There are so many escape from Iran, but each and every one of them is unique because of because the families experienced it in a very way. And so you really, I hope that you do pursue it. And they're welcome to get a hold of me. It's not a difficult task. It seems overwhelming when you first want to publish a book and get it out there. And it really is not. There are people that will help you. I'm in Massachusetts and our publisher's in LA and it was just very easy. So I hope you encourage them and they need to start by just talking out the story. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be in perfect you know, shape to immediately be published. That's an editor's job. And if I may, I, I think, you know, when you think the story is, is com is common that so many people have experienced it, it's because you're you may be in a milieu where a lot of people had some similar experiences. But if you look at most Americans, you know, the three hundred plus million Americans, most most people have never heard these stories, you know, particularly about escapes from Russia. Um, and it's, you know, so so what you what may seem like a common story to you, I think is 
something very different um, to, you know, to the general public, you know, for the general public. And I think my priority, I think I was mentioning to you earlier on that I have done interviews with BBC and ABC and CBS and all over the world, Australia and New Zealand and everywhere. Our priority is to get these this story and encourage others to get their stories in libraries and in schools. I mean, the Jewish community knows what went on and knows the horrors of a lot of these stories, but others do not. And, and it's very important that these stories get to non-Jews. And that is really our priority in working with libraries and public schools to um, have this book part of their history department that does Holocaust, a, a unit on Holocaust studies. And whenever people tell me that they bought the book, I tell them when you're done with it and your family has read it, please bring it to your public school or bring it to your library and donate it and make sure it gets on the shelves. And and that's another thing that you might tell your friend that a lot of Jews might know her story, but others do not. And that's more important. Right. And it's also, also the stories from Israel, I think, are really important about, you know, terrorism over the years and, you know, and all, you know, all the difficulties that people experienced, um, you know, and escapes from other countries, you know, Egypt, all, all over the Arab world, um, Iraq, you know, the people who experienced the Farhood or, or you know, escape for that families who escaped from there. Um, and a lot of those stories, if you go to, I mean, I was just in my public library yesterday researching something and the um unfortunately the enemies of the jewish people are writing fiction all the time to uh lay best the jewish people especially in israel um and there is a shortage i think there is a shortage of books on um you know uh, by jewish authors now I and mean, we were traditionally the 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 people of the book but uh, there's we we need a lot of these a lot more of these stories to come out i also wanted to ask you a little bit more about the experience that you went on, uh, you know, to uh, to Germany, um, you know, when you you went with your mom um, to, you know, when when Germany had these trips. Uh, my father, my parents went on one of these trips uh, shortly before before my father passed away, in, uh, you know, it was over, well, over twenty years ago, and um, you know, two thousand two, and uh, they. Um, told me that the mayor of the town came and was talking about the, the great contributions that uh, the Jews made to the town that they came from. And, um, you know, they, and, you know, they, they told, you know, I wish I had been there, but, you know, just to, to see a lot of it and to hear a, a lot of the experiences and the discussion, but I would love to hear your, you know, your other impressions of this, in addition to what your, what your mom was speaking about there and the reception that you got and what you saw and so on and, and where you, what town you went to and, and so on, if you could tell us a bit about that. It was wonderful. Um, I really have to say, and yes, every, we went to mostly, we went to a number of cities, but the main ones were Kralsheim, where my grandmother was born, and then Stuttgart, where my grandfather's family and my mom was born in Stuttgart. When my grandmother met my grandfather um, and they got married, they went to Stuttgart, which was my grandfather's area. Every town that we went to, they they asked you, where do you want to go? We are going to take you wherever you want to go, whatever you want to see. The mayors met us uh, from each of the towns, and the Minister of Cultural Affairs from Berlin met with the group and apparently met with each group that has ever gone over the last, you know, 40 years. So... What what happened was they took us wherever we wanted to go. My mom recognized a lot of things. One thing that was incredible, really incredible. My grandparents are buried in the cemetery where um, Albert Einstein's parents are buried. It was a small Jewish community. They came from the same community. Um, the Allies bombed Stuttgart and Kralsheim to the ground. The Jewish cemeteries are intact. And it was 
very freaky. I have to say it was very, because we have pictures. They showed us pictures of what these towns look like after the allies came. And it's impossible. How did these graves and these gravestones survive? But anyway, my mom recognized streets. Things had been rebuilt and recognized streets. They took us to some high schools and any of the survivors that wanted to speak were allowed to speak. And this was one of the situations where my mom, as I've mentioned in the beginning, started talking about things that I, I had no idea. Um, my mom and many of the synagogues that were burned to the ground have been rebuilt to the exact specifications. There are no Jews in Stuttgart. So the temple is used for cultural events, for art, for music, for lectures, but the, the mahogany, the chandeliers, the, the blue velvet arc cover, exactly. My mom felt like she was walking into, she said, grandpa sat over there, we sat over here, we sat in the pews where my grandmother and my mom sat. The other thing is that, and a lot of people don't realize this, but every place where the train stopped to the cattle cars, stopped to pick up the Jews, there are huge granite monuments noting that that was a place where Jews were deported. And so I felt like they they call it, they don't call it the Nazi era. They call it the other era. They, they have a different name for it. But um, I felt like they had done a lot to remember, to not hide what happened. There were a lot of memorials like that at every cattle car stop. And um, so one of the places that we went, one of the schools, this grand, this young woman, a high school student, stood up during the question and answer period and told a story about how one day she was baking cookies with her grandmother, and um, which would have been someone of my generation. And the grandmother um, started crying and saying that she was a teacher and the Nazis had come in and taken one of the girls out of the classroom, the Jew, one of the Jewish, one of the Jewish girls out of the classroom. And her grandmother didn't know what to do. She didn't know what to do. And she's suffered about that her whole life. And her granddaughter knew that story. So, you know, the other thing is they filmed us uh, for a TV. I'm sure this peace didn't get on, but they they were filming while we were there. And the Minister of Cultural Affairs said, we want our Jewish citizens back. You were the leaders in art, in science, in technology. You were contributors to our society and we want you back. And I said, we will never come back because we do not consider ourselves German Jews. We are American Jews, we are German, we are uh, uh, Argentinian Jews, we are Israeli Jews, but we don't consider ourselves German Jews because we were thrown out. And I don't think that made it on the set, but it was a point that was brought up multiple times that they wanted their you know, we, you know, they would well, they wanted the Jews to come back to Germany. And I just said, that's not, that's not going to happen. Although I understand a lot of um, younger German Jews are going back and um, some are even getting citizenship, not for me, but um, it's just interesting. So the trip was wonderful. And um, I felt like it brought my mom to a different place where she had closure. She had closure. Mm -hmm. And for the, for the, for the, for those who don't know, um, the uh, German government uh, does provide citizenship for descendants of Jews who were thrown out. You know, you have to bring a lot of documentation and so on. Um, 
and you know, which some people are doing because then they can travel around the EU pretty easily. Um, right. Uh, let's see. Oh, I, I, Alan Jay, my colleague, uh, my ZOA colleague, uh, had to leave, and he wanted us wanted me to mention, by the way, that um, we have a tentative webinar scheduled with the Nahala movement on June fifth at one p.m. with Daniel Weiss and Lital Memorosh. Um, Memorosh Sloman, Nahala Movement? I don't know. Nahala aims at enhancing settlement in Judea and Samaria and educational Zionistic goals. Nahala hosts ZOA and takes us around Judea and Samaria when we host missions in Israel. The ladies will also discuss what they suggest should happen in Gaza after the war. Uh, we will send an email invitation once we make final confirmation. We also have some uh, other book clubs planned, which we will be sending out by email. So please watch for that. Um, and Donald Lewin, um, I don't know if he wants to, to speak yeah, live. Or I want to ask, I, I mean, he wrote this really good. His father was also in Dachau and then um, ended up at a military base in England. So that's a very interesting story. And Donald, I hope that you um write this story as well this is very your story is very fascinating oh yeah I, I just want i just want to read the story because i don't think everybody can see the chat oh okay um, okay uh, Do donna lumen wrote wrote the following story and if he wants to speak live please raise your hand and then so we can get you on live uh my father an austrian businessman who was a partner in a manufacturer was was a partner in a manufacturer okay who was a partner in a manufacturing business the day after the anschluss um, he was arrested in his office. He was taken to Buchenwald and from there to Dachau. He was released and given a three-day pass to go home to Vienna. There he arranged with one of his business friends to get to England via a sealed rail car, notwithstanding that he had a visa to get to France, thanks to his younger sister, who was an employee of the French government. He arrived in England and was one of the Jews assigned to a dilapidated World War I military base called Kitchener camp. He arrived four days before the invasion of Poland. And then he goes on. He impressed the base commander who assigned him various tasks, notwithstanding that he was an enemy alien. He was active during the period between the declaration of war and, and serious fighting began. He was rewarded with a ticket and a visa to the United States. But, but I want to know how he was released and given a three day pass out of Dachau to go home to Vienna. That is fascinating so i hope donald if you're still on that you write this story because this is fascinating to me how all of this happened mm -hmm. my, my uh, grandfather i believe was in daco also earlier like um you know before you know they obviously left two months before um crystal knocked but um they were able to give a ton of money to a german lawyer who was able to get him out i think that was must have been around 1936 so that that was feasible too but only earlier on not not you know not one not once crystal knock hit or um you know they, so yeah. i mean they were tortured they they were worked to death a lot of them were worked to death at dachau yeah, but the ones that story. survived were tortured constantly in the book my uh, my grandfather, it's interesting because I didn't even know this, but apparently once my grandfather kind of blurted out as, to my sister as he was staring out the living room window that in the snow, they would make everybody go out in the snow. They would hose them down with cold water. That was their showers and then send them back into the unheated, uh, you know, bunkers. Um, things like that. I mean, you know, it's hard to read, but uh, the fact that some people got out with a, you know, with a three day pass or your, your family that got that out much earlier, much earlier when it was more like a, you know, yes, this was 38. Yeah. Know. Much earlier. It was more, more like a prison. It was a work um, camp. Yes. Yeah, so, so it was, um, you know, so it was more possible. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but anyway, um, any other questions? I'm trying to trying to let me just check. Um, UNA, I think we have some more. Okay, Pauline Schwager, can you give more detail about your cousin actually rescuing your father when he got there and whom he had to deal with and how that went? <laughs> so um, basically, I purposely stayed away from that just so that you would 
read the book. But um, to to answer your question, after going people read the book any people read the book anyway. So <laughs> uh, after he got through all those checkpoints, he went to the gates of Dachau, and um, he showed his papers. They said, and he said, um, I'm here to get an Adolf Mueller. And it even describes in the book how he tried to muster up like this, you know, this strength and this sort of tough um, persona, even though he was scared to death. Um, and he, and as you had mentioned, Liz, they were like, well, why, what do you, what do you want? And, my, and he just said, I am following orders. And basically they went and they got him. And at first um, his brother-in-law did not recognize him. He did not think that it was him. And he said, is this Adolf Mueller? Because he was so thin and so sickly looking. And they said, yes. And apparently, uh, you know, they kind of looked in each other's eyes and he realized that this was um, his cousin. And um, he roughly put him in the car as though he was going to, you know, take him and shoot him in the backyard or whatever. And that was, that's how, and so they, they got in the back in the car and they immediately this is still night. It's still like at this point, probably four or five in the morning. They went back to Stuttgart. They went to the Catholic church and got my mom. And we do not know where my grandmother was at this time or how he got her. No one spoke about it. And my mom never knew where my grandmother was or who was hiding her or where she was hiding, but he was able to get both of them and they immediately continued their drive um, to Luxembourg and to um, my grandmother's brother who lived there. And it took a year to get their visa, but they were relatively safe in Luxembourg and um, and then they went to Antwerp, Belgium, which is where they got the boat to come to America. Wow. Um, oh, I wanted to uh, also mention to Josh Ravitch, who's trying to convince his uh, Russian Jewish immigrant friend to write her story, that um, you can tell her that um, if she writes it, then we'll we'll bring her on to the ZOA book club. So a lot more people will hear about it. Um, and we also have another comment from Pauline Schwager uh, that a few years ago, um, her daughter published a book about um, Pauline's husband, um, which is you know, her daughter's father, obviously, about his experiences as a Holocaust survivor. It is called Chasing Tomorrows by Kara Martin Race. And we'd be happy to, to look at that too. I think this is, this is important and it's especially important now with the hostages in, in Gaza, um, you know, and, you know, to, to have these, at least, you know, some of the stories of hope from, from darkness um, and, you know, survival of, of this, of this horrible darkness, you know, who, and, you know, we're always, you know, I'm sure every day, everyone is thinking about what the hostages are going through, you know, on a daily basis. And, you know, and we're hoping and praying for the, you know, for miraculous saves, you know, for them and, and that they will, um, you know, be able to come home to their, to their loved ones. And, and survive. Um, I would, uh, let, let me just also, again, remind everybody about the parade. Um, the uh, uh, On June 2nd, please sign up. Uh, uh, the uh, I think at the top of the chat, we have the, um, the link to do that, or just go on to the ZOA website. Um, and please, you know, please, Feel free to join with a, to join with the ZOA contingent in the Israel Day Parade on June second. Free T-shirt, free water, and you know, great day and you know of meeting uh, fellow Zionists and and people of people who really love Israel, um, and you know, show your support for Israel. It's 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 a very important event and the event that we're having on. Please watch your emails for the event that we're having on June fifth at one o'clock. 
And I would like to um, give our guest Susan uh, an opportunity for any follow uh, final words. Well, I just want to say that, um, again, my final words are especially to you, Josh, um, really these stories need to be published and they need to be in libraries, they need to be in schools. And I hope that your friend will do this. Uh, she can get in touch with me if she has questions about how to start. And um, I just once again want to thank you um, so much, uh, Liz and Jackie, for having me on the book club and allowing me to talk about my mom's memoir. Thank you, Susan. We really appreciate you coming on and I'm so grateful to your family and to your mom for writing this important story. And thank you everybody for being with us. It's wonderful to see everyone and, uh, you know, have a wonderful, uh, wonderful rest of the week. All the best. Thank you.